O Lord, who for our sake did fast 40 days and 40 nights, give us grace to have such self-control and discipline that our flesh may be subdued to your almighty spirit and we may ever obey your godly motions in righteousness and holiness to your honor and glory. Amen. Well, we're in the second volume of Bishop Gilbert. Burnett's History of the Reformation, Volume 2, and we're starting with the life and reign of King Edward VI. Edward VI, King of England of that name, was the only son of King Henry VIII by his beloved Queen Jane Seymour, or St. Maur, S-T-M-A-U-R, like a saint daughter to Sir John Seymour, who was descended from Roger St. Maur, that married one of the daughters and heirs of the Lord Beauchamp of Hodge. Their ancestors came into England with William the Conqueror and had at that time several times made themselves considerable by the noble acts they did in the wars. Edward was born at Hampton Court on the 12th day of October, being St. Edward's Eve in the year 1537, and lost his mother the day after. And he's got a footnote here. The King's Journal printed by the Lord, Your Lordship says, within a few days after the birth of her son, she died. George Lilly, who lived at the same time and near the place, duo, duo decimo post dia mor, mortar. And so the continuation of Fabian, they seem to be the best authorities. <coughs> Queen Jane died the 24th of October in a journal written by Cecil. That was in 12 days after King Edward's birth. So it is in the Herald's office. So he's born 12 October, lost his mother the day after he was born, who died not by the cruelty of the Chirurgians ripping up her belly to make way for the prince's birth, as some writers gave out, to represent King Henry Barbarous and cruel in all his action, whose report has been since too easily followed. But as the original letters that are yet extant show, she was well delivered of him. The day following was taken with the distemper incident to women in that condition of which she died. He was soon after christened the Archbishop of Canterbury, be Tom Cranmer, 1537. A lot going on in that year, monasteries going down, Cromwell on the roll. He's known as a Lutheran, and the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk being his godfathers, according to the journal. Though Hall says the last was only his godfather when he was bishoped. He continued under the charge and care of the women till he was six years old, and then was put under the government of Dr. Cox and Mr. Cheek. The one was to be his pre preceptor for manners, and the knowledge of philosophy and divinity, the other for tongues and mathematics. He was also provided with masters for the French and all other things becoming a, print, a, a prince, the heir, he also great a crown. He gave very early indications of good disposition to learning and of a wonderful probity of mind, and above all, great respect to religion. We got here the grace of the sacrament of unction. There could be no doubt. This was Wednesday, October 24. I guess this is the death. And the following extract, extract from a contemporary di diary is conclusive. On St. Edward's Eve, Friday in the morning, was Prince Edward born, the true son of K.H. the Eighth and Queen Jane. Queen... 
his mother in Hampton Court. His godfather was the Duke of North, Norfolk and the Duke of Suffolk and the Bishop of Canterbury. His grandmother was his own sister, which was daughter of Queen Catherine aforesaid. On St. Crispin's Eve, Wednesday, did Queen Jane in childbed and his bed read in the castle of Windsor. Extract from page 11 of the London Chronicle during the reign of Henry VII and Henry VIII. And, um, and he, so he's getting trained and everything relating to it. So that when he was once reached once in hit out of in one of his childish diversions, somewhat being to be reached at, that he and his companions were too low for one. One of them laid on the floor a great Bible that was in the room to step on, which he beholding with indignation took up the Bible himself and gave over his play for that time. He was in all things subject to the orders laid down for his education and profited so much in learning that all about him conceived great hopes of extraordinary things from him if he should live. Such unusual beginnings seem rather to threaten the too early end of a life that by all appearance was likely to have produced such astonishing things. He was so forward in his learning that before he was eight years old, he wrote Latin letters to his father, who was a prince of that stern severity, that one can hardly think those about his son durst cheat him by making letters for him. He used also at that age to write both to his godfather the Archbishop of Canterbury, interesting, and to his uncle, who was made Viscount Beauchamp, as descended from that family, and soon afterward, Earl of Hertford. It seems Queen Catherine Parr understood Latin, for he wrote to her also in the same language. But the full character of this young prince is given us by Cardan, who writ it after his death and in Italy, where this prince was accounted an heretic, so that there was nothing to be got or expected by flattering him. And yet it is so great, and withal so agreeing in all things to the truth, that as I shall begin my collection of papers at the end of this volume with his words in Latin, so it will be very fit to give them here in English. This is Cardin. All the graces were in him. He had many tongues when he was yet but a child. Together with the English, his natural tongue, he had both Latin and French. Nor was, nor was he ignorant, as I hear, of the Greek, Italian, and Spash, Spanish, and perhaps some more. But for the English, French, and Latin, he was exact in them, and apt to learn everything. Nor was he ignorant of logic, of the principles of natural philosophy, nor of music. The sweetness of his temper was such as becomes a mortal his gravity becoming the majesty of the king and his disposition suitable to a high degree. In sum, the child was so bred, had such parts, was of such expectation that he looked like the miracle of a man. Are not spoken rhetorically and beyond the truth, but are indeed short of it. He was a marvelous boy. When I was with him, he was in the 15th year of age. That would make him one, 1552, in which he spake Latin as politely and as promptly as I did. He asked me what was the subject of my books, De Rerum Varietata, which I had dedicated to him. I answered that in the first chapter, I gave the true cause of comets, which had long been inquired into, but what never found out. What is it? said he. I said it was the concourse of the light of wandering stars. He answered, how can that be since the stars move in different motions? 
How comes it that comets are not soon dissipated or don't move after them according to their motions? To this I answer, they do move after them, but much quicker than they, by reason of a different aspect. As we see in a crystal, or when a rainbow rebounds from the wall, for a little change makes a great difference of place. But the king said, how can that be, where there is no subject to receive that light? To this I answered that this was as in the Milky Way, where many candles were lighted. The middle place where their shining met was white and clear. From this little taste, it may be imagined what he was, and indeed the ingenuity and sweetness of his disposition had raised in all good and learned men the greatest expectation of impossible. He began to love the liberal hurts before he knew them, and to know them before he could use them. And in him there was such an attempt of nature, that not only in England, but the world, as reason to lament his being so early snatched away. This is Cardin's account. How truly was it said of such extraordinary persons that their lives are short and sim seldom do they come to be old. He gave us an essay on virtue, though he did not live to give a pattern of it. When the gravity of a king was needful, he carried himself like an old man. And yet he was always affable and gentle, as became his age. He played on the lute, he meddled in affairs of state, and for bounty he did in that emulate his father, though he, even when endeavored to be too good, might appear to have been bad. But there was no ground of suspecting any such thing in the sun, whose mind was cultivated by the study of philosophy. It has been said in the end of his father's life that he then designed to create him Prince of Wales. For though he was called so, as the heirs of this crown are, and he was not by a formal creation invested with the dignity. This pretense was made use of to hasten forward the attainder of the Duke of Norfolk, since he had many offices for life which the king intended to dispose of and desired to have them speedily filled in order to the creating of his son, Prince of Wales. In the meantime, his father died, and the Earl of Hertford and Sir Anthony Brown were sent by the council to give him notice of it, being then at Hertford, and to bring him to the Tower of London. And having brought him to Enfield with his sis sister, Lady Elizabeth, they let him know of his father's death, and that now he was the king. On the 31st of January, the king's death was published in London, and he proclaimed king. At the tower, his father's executors, with the rest of the Privy Council, received him with respects due to their king, so tempering their sorrow for the death of their late master with the joy for his son's happy succeeding him, that by an excess of joy they may not seem to have forgot the one so soon, nor to bode ill to the other by an extreme grief. The first thing they did was the opening of the king's will. <coughs> Excuse me. By which they found he had nominated 16 persons to be his executors and governors to his son and to the kingdom till his son was 18 years of age. These were the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lord Raya Thessaly, Lord Chancellor, the Lord St. John, Great Master, the Lord Russell, Lord Privy Seal, the Earl of Hertford, Lord Great Chamberlain, the Viscount Lloyd, Lyle, Lord Admiral, Tunstall, Bishop of Durham, Sir Anthony Brown, Master of the Horse, William Paget, Secretary of State, Sir Edward North, Chancellor of the Court of Augmentations, Sir Edward Montague, Lord Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, Judge Bromley, 
Sir Anthony Denny, and Sir William Herbert, Chief Gentleman of the Privy Chamber, Sir Edward Watton, Treasurer of Calais, and Dr. Watton, Dean of Canterbury and York. These or the other major part of them were to execute his will and to administer the affairs of the kingdom. By their consent were the king and his sisters to be disposed of in marriage. But with this difference, that it was only ordered that the king should marry by their advice. But the two sisters were so limited in their marriage that they were to forfeit their right of succession if they married without their consent it being of far greater importance to the peace and interest of the nation who should be their husbands if the crown did devolve on them and who should be the king's wife. And by the act passed in the 35th year of King Henry, he was empowered to leave the crown to them with what limitations he should think fit. To the executors, the king added by his will a privy council who should be assisting to them. These were the Earls of Arundel and Essex, Sir Thomas Shaney, Treasurer of the Household, Sir John Gage, Comptroller, Sir Anthony Wingfield, Vice Chamberlain, Sir William Peter, Secretary of State, Sir Richard Rich, Sir John Baker, Sir Ralph Sadler, Sir Thomas Seymour, Sir Richard Southwell, and Sir Edmund Peckham. The king also ordered that if any of the executors should, should die, the survivors, without giving them a power of substituting others, should continue to administer affairs. He also charged them to pay all his debts and the legacies he left, and to perfect any grants he had begun, and to make good everything that he had promised. The will being opened and read, all the executors, Judge Bromley and the two Wattons only accepted, were present and did resolve to execute the will in all points and to take an oath for their faithful discharge of the trust. But it was also proposed that for the speedier dispatch of things, and for a more certain order and direction of all affairs, there should be one chosen to be head of the rest to whom ambassadors and others might address themselves. It was added to caution this, that the person to be raised to that dignity should do nothing of any sort without the advice and consent of the greater part of the rest. But this was opposed by the Lord Chancellor, who thought that the dignity of his office, setting him next to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who did not much follow secular <laughs> affairs, he should have the chief stroke in the government. Well, isn't that an interesting sideline? Who did not much follow secular affairs. That's a keeper. That is a keeper right there. Was not expecting that. I should have, therefore, he pressed that they might not depart from the king's will in any particular, neither by adding to it nor taking from it. It was plain knowing the king intended they should all alike follow in the administration and the raising one to a title or degree above the rest was a great change from what he ordered. And whereas it was now said that the person to be thus nominated was to have no manner of power over the rest that was only to exalt him into a higher dignity with the less envy or apprehension of danger for it was certain that great titles always make way for high power. But the Earl of Hertford had so many, so great a party among them that it was agreed to. The Lord Chancellor himself consenting when he saw his opposition was without effect, that one should be raised, the rest in title, to be called protector of the king's realms and the governor of his person. The next point held no long debate who should be nominated to this high trust. For they unanimously agreed that the Earl of Hertford, by reason of his nearness of blood to the king, 
and the great experience he had in affairs was the fittest person. So he was declared protector of the realm, governor of the king's person, but with that express, express and special condition that he should not do any act but by the advice and consent of the other executors according to the will of the late king. They all went to take their oaths, but it was proposed that they, it should be delayed till the next day, that so it might be done upon better consideration. More was not done that day, save that the Lord Chancellor was ordered to deliver up the seals to the king and to receive them again from his hand. hand. For King Henry's seal was to be made use of either till a new one was made or until the king was crowned. He also ordered to renew the commissions of the judges, the justi <coughs> justices of the peace, the presidents of the North and of Wales, and of some other officers. This was the issue of the first council day under the king, in which the so easy advancement of the Earl of Hertford to so, such high dignity gave a great occasion to censure, it seeming to be a change of what King Henry had designed. But the king's great kindness to his uncle made it pass smoothly, for the rest of the executives not being of ancient nobility, but courtiers were drawn in easily to comply with that which was so acceptable to their young king. Only the Lord Chancellor, who had chiefly opposed it, was to expect the small favor at the new protector's hands. It was soon apparent what emulation there was between them, and the nation being then divided between those who loved the old superstition and those who desired a more complete reformation. The protector set himself at the head of one and the Lord Chancellor at the head of the other party. The next day the executors met again and first took their oaths most solemnly for their faithful executing the will. They also ordered all those who were by the late king named privy councillors to come into the king's presence and there declared to the king the choice they made of his uncle who gave his assent to it. It also signified to the lords of the council who likewise with one voice gave consent to it. And dispatches were ordered to be sent to the emperor, the French king, the region of Flanders, giving notice of the king's death and of the constitution of the council and nomination of the protector during the minority of their young king. All dispatches were ordered to be signed only by the protector and all the temporal lords with all the bishops about the town were commanded to come and swear allegiance to the king. On the 2nd of February, the protector was declared Lord Treasurer and Earl Marshal, these places having been designed for him by the late king upon the Duke of Norfolk's folks attainder. Letters were also sent to Calais, Boulogne, Ireland, the marches of Scotland and most of the counties of England, giving notice of the king's succession and of the order now settled. The will was also ordered to be enrolled and every of the executors was to have an exemplification of it under the great seal. And the clerks of the council were ordered to give to every one of them an account of all things done in council under their hands and seals. The bishops take out commissions for their bishoprics. The bishops were required to take out new commissions of the same form with those they'd taken out in King Henry's time, for which see the former part, volume one, page 267. Only with this difference, that there is no mention made of a vicar general in these commissions as was in the former there being none after Cromwell advanced to that dignity. Two of these commissions are yet extant, one taken out by Cranmer, 
the other taken out by Bonner. But this was only done by reason of the present juncture, because the bishops, being generally addicted to the former superstition, it was thought necessary to keep them under so arbitrary a power as that subjected them to. For they hereby, for they hereby held their bishops only during the king's pleasure and were to exercise them as his delegates in his name and by his authority. Cranmer set an example to the rest and took out his commission, which is in the collection. But this was afterwards judged too heavy a yoke, and therefore the new bishops that were made by this king were not put under it. And so Ridley, when made Bishop of London in Bonner's Rome, was not required to take out any such commission, but they were to hold their bishoprics during life. There was a clause in the king's will requiring his executors to make good all that he had promised in any manner of ways, whereupon Sir William Paget, Sir Anthony Denny, Sir William Herbert, were required to declare what they knew of the king's intentions and promises, the former being the secretary whom he trusted most, the other two, those that attended on him in his bedchamber during his sickness, though they were called gentlemen of the privy chamber. For the service of the gentlemen of the bedchamber was not then set up. Paget declared that when the evidence appeared against the Duke of Norfolk and his son, the Earl of Surrey, the king, who used to talk oft in private with him alone, told him that he intended to bestow their lands liberally, and since by attainders and other ways the nobility were much decayed, he intended to create some peers and ordered him to write a book as he thought neatest, who thereupon proposed the Earl of Hertford to be a duke, the Earl of Essex to be a Marquis, the Viscount Lyle to be an Earl, the Lords St. John, Russell and Ryothesley to be Earls, and Sir Thomas Seymour, Sir Thomas Shaney, Sir Richard Rich, Sir William Willoughby, Sir Thomas Arundel, Sir Edmund Sheffield, Sir St. John Ledger, Sir Wimbish, Sir Vernon the Peak, and Sir Christopher Danby to be barons. Paget also proposed a distribution of the Duke of Norfolk's estate, but the king liked it not, and made Mr. Gates bring him the books of that estate, which being done, he ordered Pad Paget to tote, tot upon my lord of Hertford's head. These are all the words of the deposition, a thousand marks. On Lord Lyle, St. John Russell, 200 pounds a year to Lord Ryothesley, 100 pounds, and for Sir Thomas Seymour, 300 pounds a year. But Paget said it was too little and stood long arguing with him. Yet the king ordered him to propose it to the person's concern and see how they liked it. And he putting the king in mind of Denny, who often been a suitor for him, but he had never yet in lieu of that obtained anything for Denny. The king ordered 200 pounds for him and 400 marks for Sir William Herbert and remembered of some others likewise. But Paget, having according to the king's commands spoken to these who were to be advanced, found that many of them desired to continue in their former ranks and thought the lands the king intended to give were not sufficient for the maintenance of the honor to be conferred on them which he reported to the best advantage he could for every man, and endeavored to raise the king's favor to them as high as he could. But while this was in consultation, the Duke of Norfolk, very prudently apprehending the ruin of his posterity, if his lands were divided into many hands, out of which he could not easily recover them, Whereas if they continued in the crown, some turn of affairs might again establish his family. And intending also to oblige the king by so unusual a compliment, sent a desire to him 
that he would be pleased to settle all his lands on the prince, the now king, and not give them away. For, said he, according to the phrase of that time, they are goodly and stately gear. This wrought so far on the king that he resolved to reserve them for himself and to reward his servants some other way. Whereupon Paget pressed him once to resolve on the honors he would bestow and what he would give with him. The king, growing still worse, said to him that if anything came to him but good, as he thought he could not long endure, he intended to place them all about his son as men whom he trusted and loved above all other. So after many consultations, he ordered the book to be thus filled up. The Earl of Hertford to be Earl Marshal and Lord Treasurer, and to be Duke of Somerset, Exeter, or Hertford, and his son to be Earl of Wiltshire, with 800 pounds a year of land. And here we'll have to call it to an end. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.